Hi, welcome to the L Rush Show, where I deliver content intended to inspire, educate, and motivate. Engage with me online at lrush.com and on social media. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Today, my guest is very well known, and I'll explain why. You may not know her name, Christine Carlson, but she is best known as the co-author with her late husband, Dr. Richard Carlson of the New York Times bestselling Don't Sweat the Small Stuff series of books. And she is featured this fall as the subject of a biopic lifetime movie based on her book, Heartbroken Open, a true story of coming alive again after profound loss. Now the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff series of books that she co-authored with her late husband has sold more than 25 million copies worldwide. She's been on the Today Show, The View, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and so on. But after her husband's untimely death, Christine journaled for two years, working very hard to maintain the brand they had cultivated together and slowly but steadily rediscovering her life's joy. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Christine. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Al. So I am old enough to remember the series of books you created with your husband, the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff series, and I'm sure many people listening, I mean, there's every topic imaginable, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff for Moms, right? For, for every level, and what a wonderful series that became so profoundly popular, over 25, 30 million copies sold. Uh, your, your bio is incredible. But so I guess before we get into Heartbroken Open, which I, I really want to talk about, and of course, the, the biopic Lifetime movie coming out this fall, I, can you give everyone a, a brief rundown of where you started with your husband in this Don't Sweat the Small Stuff series? Sure. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you know, I, I like to kind of start at the beginning, which is we met in college and we had a... Um, really wonderful marriage. We married after four years of college and um, we just, you know, began our lives together like everyone else does. And Richard had a practice. Um, he'd gotten his master's and PhD in psychology and he had a practice teaching people how to be happy called happiness training. And he began his writing career and it was kind of your overnight success story. It took about 10 books in 10 years <laughs> so for anyone listening that is aspiring to be a writer you know it, it it can take a while um it's not always your first book that's the you know big hit bestseller what but was the 10th one what was the 10th one that, that was launched it? the small stuff gotcha yeah so his prior work was all about happiness he was one of the first authors to ever put the um word happy in a title in his book you can be happy no matter what um, he wrote a series of mental health and well-being books um, about happiness. You can feel good again, shortcut through therapy. And then he um, wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in 1997 and then invited me to write with him in the series Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love a couple of years later. And then I um, and then he asked me to write my first solo book in the series Don't Sweat the Small Stuff for Women. So, I mean, I'm sure people are wondering, I know I am, it's like, wow, okay, you're, you're dating and then married a guy who's sort of a happiness expert. Uh, I'm assuming you had a happy life. What are some tools and things you did use? I'm sure you wrote them in your, your book about love, but what are some tips you can give to people that happen along the way or, or ways that your husband treated things that I'm sure were clearly different than most people who were uncoached themselves in this way of thinking? Yeah, well, um, I think one of the beautiful things about Richard was he truly was a genuinely um, happy person. And he had a very high quotient, like happiness quotient, you know, his emotional intelligence was very high. And mine, mine is and was as always, too. So um, we, at the beginning of our marriage, one of the things I love to share is that um, we started a practice of communication together. We were both meditators. Um, we we're both on a spiritual path, which we we're very fortunate that um, over time, over the 25 year span of our relationship, we were very fortunate to have grown, continued to grow together in that relationship. Whereas a lot of people um, through 25 years, they, they fall apart at some point along the way. But we had some pretty extraordinary communication that, that was founded on a practice that we started in our marriage early on. And we would um, hold up, we'd, we'd have 
a time every week set aside it would be about an hour, an hour and a half. And we would use that time as a time to communicate about all the things that we were grateful for in our relationship and some of the things that um, maybe happened during the week that we would like to have seen uh, happen differently or, you know, it'd be a time to communicate if we were feeling not so um, appreciated or listened to or anything. But we had a few ground rules and this was really important. Like we had set up the, um, the ground rules and the ground ro- rules went something like this. Whoever was holding the heart while speaking was the only one that could be speaking. And the, um, the other one of us just had to listen. We had to just listen with a quality of what I like to say is empty presence, um, just listening. And when it was our turn, we could address what was said um, uh, back to the person, you know, um, but hopefully like we'd always hope that we wouldn't be um, eliciting a negative response. We also had the rule that we wouldn't blame. We would say things gently and kindly and with love. And the whole idea behind this was really to facilitate healthy communication, in which case it really did. Um, We did this for, I don't know, a number of months, maybe six months. And finally, we just stopped doing it because we just started communicating all the time like this. And it was beautiful. We would always end with something we were very grateful for with each other. And, um, and we always, it it was very helpful to receive, you know, those things that might be bothering each other that were might been small stuff, but still small things can turn into big things rather quickly when they're not addressed and and they can be suppressed. So um, one of the beautiful lessons I learned early on was that when I was feeling a certain way. It was likely that Richard was feeling that way too. And that we really had become like mirrors of one another. And I think if we look at relationship like that, then um, it's very helpful. You know, it's extremely helpful to look at conflict as, and ask the question, return, you know, how is this reflecting back to me myself? Can you, uh, I love this. Can you give an example maybe of something you did bring up back then? So maybe something that was small, like an annoyance and how you might've approached it, what you would have said to give the audience some sort of, you know, format. Yeah. Like well, they like, can word something, you know, like, um, I can't remember a specific example cause it was probably 35 years ago now, <laughs> but, but I can say that I do remember a very specific time when Richard was feeling like I was not appreciative of him. And I also felt the same way. Um, I also felt that he wasn't appreciative of me during that time. And so I, and that was really how, what it taught me was over and over again, I would see when he would say something like that, I would be like, Oh, I feel that way too. Oh, we're just both. We're just both feeling that way. So how can we change that? You know, how can we, you know, and I, I started to learn to say things to Richard, like, you know, hey, hon, thank you so much for uh, working so hard for our family. You know, thank you so much for taking out the trash. You know, thank you so much for all that you do to make my life um, a better life, you know, and, and thank you so much for being a wonderful father, you know, and not letting those, those simple thank yous, those simple um, gratitudes really go unsaid. That was really important for both of us. And we got to be really proficient at that over our marriage, just always acknowledging. And then also just talking about the things that didn't work. You know, the things when we were in a moment, instead of attacking one another, which a lot of couples do, we just said, Hey, you know, that's not really working for me. Can we sit down and talk about this? And it really did work well in our marriage. Um, we had a beautiful friendship. In fact, the first chapter in Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love is called Mostly Be Pals because yes. we had discovered that um, through the duration of our 25 year marriage, that when you treat each other as best friends, um, you treat each other with the utmost respect. Yes. And yeah. And that respect was at the cornerstone of what makes for a beautiful, great relationship and also a long-term connection. And yeah, I, like- I, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I love that. No, I love that so much because I was actually doing a solo episode not too long ago and I was talking about how it's so interesting how the the difference between people and the way they might react to a family member. They would never treat their friend that way no. ever. We don't no. ever. It's such an interesting thing. And, and then it goes back to my dad used to always say, he told some couple once that I was about to get married. He's like, you have to be pals and you have to be lovers. You can't be one without the other. And he like gave them a whole lecture and they inscribed it on their rings, pals and lovers. But it is so true. It's so interesting how we, gosh, we just get out of alignment when it's, you know, talking to a brother or his cousin or, you know, someone who's in our family. And yet you would never treat your friends that way. That's so true. That is so, so true. And I think when you remember that, you know, you remember that I, you know, that there's no ownership because you're married to somebody or you're partnered with somebody. There's no ownership. You're still your own person. They're their own person. Um, you, you can't own, you can't treat somebody like you own them. Um, I think that's the other piece for uh, creating a great marriage and relationship um, in general is just, you know, uh, not taking each other for granted, you know, really appreciating not taking each other for granted. And again, just treating, you know, treating them with such kindness and respect. Um, and then when you blow it, apologize, you know, it's kind of simple, right? It's like, <laughs> own it. Own it. everybody blows it sometimes, you know, it's like, just say you're sorry, you know, own it. It's like, I think that that's the most anybody can ask for in, in relationship is, is, is to be respected, to um, have a partner or a significant other that's kind to them, and then have one that's got the humility to apologize when things go awry. Um, we always said, you know, one of my favorite quotes of Richard is, it's more important to be kind than to be right. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so those are, the, those are the kinds of things that we practiced on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have to say, you know, for the most part, the Don't Split the Small Stuff books came out of the chapters of our lives. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all stuff that's doable. And I think that's why this series is relevant today and why people still buy the books today. I mean, that little book, Don't Split the Small Stuff, is still, um, after, you know, 25 years, still in the top 1% of Amazon. So, well, and what I love about all of it, including how you chose to communicate with each other with expressing appreciation, not taking that for granted, it always seems like the other side of sweating something that's small is gratitude, right? Oh, truly. So let's just get into that a bit because I'm assuming, I mean, not that we would just go, hey, uh, you know, you don't need to read the books, just <laughs> look at something positive, but it is where we turn our attention. It is an actual a move we have to consciously make in our heads, but if we make it, things are going to look brighter and you're not going to sweat the small stuff. Just tell us more about gratitude and that, and that, because we, you know, express the appreciation, but what about just you as individuals going throughout your life through a marriage? I'm assuming there were times where you might've had to bite your tongue a little bit and go, hold on, move to gratitude. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think everything in life is a practice. And when we remember that it's, it's not about perfection. It's about practicing. It's about getting doing, doing it over and over again, um, the way you want to live it. And I think, um, as far as gratitude goes, you know, it's, it's so great because now the research and science has caught up to the practices that we wrote about, you know, years and years and years ago about, you know, something simple, like wake up and think of three things you love about your partner or your family or your life. And, if you wake up in gratitude and you go to bed in gratitude, that's even better. So if you can, you know, think of three things that you love about your partner, your kids, your life before you go to sleep, and then you wake up thinking about three things you love, you're setting yourself up for really like a, a, a much better day. And it's because so much of our um, world is seen through the lens from which we see it and, and the mindset we have where our mind is. And, and if your mind is focused on what you're grateful for, noticing all that you have to be grateful for, then it's not focused on what's going wrong or the negativity that can also swallow us up sometimes. So um, these are practices. And I think the more we, we think of it like that, that, oh, it's a practice. I'm practicing. I'm training my mind 
to behave. I'm training my mind to, to be um, the ship. You know, I'm navigating my own mind. I'm navigating my own ship. So um, these are the kinds of things that uh, Richard and I practiced on an ongoing basis. And it becomes quite natural after a while. It comes, becomes quite natural to live in this sort of sense of contentment. And I think that Prior to this time period, possibly people used to think of contentment as being um, sort of apathetic and it's not at all yeah. apathetic. Like, and I think that that's a um, misnomer, you know. Yeah, content misguided. sort of seems uh, synonymous with um, settling, I think, in people's mind, the way they, the connotation. Yeah, and it's not that at all. I mean, contentment is actually a great place to start. Um, because then it's just everything's icing on the cake. I mean, I'm an incredibly content person, but I'm also incredibly ambitious. So I continue to work, probably never had to, but I continue to do so because I, I love my work. I'm passionate, um, you know, and, and, and these are things that um, I think are super important to, to life and to the pursuit of happiness is, you know, inherently it's, important to be grateful. It's important to um, acknowledge passion in your life and, and to follow the breadcrumbs of what really excites you in your day. Um, and then, and then practicing, you know, how to start from this place of, of feeling really good, which is what contentment is. It's a peaceful feeling. I mean, you know, I think uh, it, it just makes everything on top of that, just, just so much better and so much bigger. Give us a few tips because you are a parent, you've raised two daughters and, you know, a lot easier as adults in a marriage to sort of practice and be aware and conscious of these things. And then, you know, little kids are like, you know, throwing a toy at the other kid and stealing. Stuff. <laughs> and so, so tell us a few tips maybe for parents on there out there about how you guys chose to impart this wisdom. I'm um, obviously you live through example. That is the best way. Um, but what are some things that maybe you could share with parents out there who are trying to get their children to, you know, see life in a different way here and put on those those rose colored glasses in the positive way. Well, that's, that's so funny. Cause immediately I think about like how people used to watch us parenting. And I had this one woman come up to us one time and come up to me and she said, you know, I watched Richard with your daughter at kindergarten once. And I was just waiting. She was tugging on him, tugging on him and tugging on him. And I was just waiting to see what kind of wisdom came out of his mouth. And he turned to her and he said, Hey, Hey, get off, get off me. Stop doing that. <laughs> right. Just a classic. <laughs> so, you know, despite the fact that, you know, uh, we, we did practice life in a really great way. I have to say, and Richard would have said this too. Um, our kids probably tested us more than anything and they were definitely our biggest tests and also our greatest privilege, you know, and oh, yeah. They, they really, I mean, we used to just laugh. Like we used to say, if you had played us a videotape of what our lives would be like after children and shown us like all the different scenarios, we would have been like, oh, no way. We're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no way. We're not cut out for that. You know, and no way. We're not. That's just, <laughs> the, that's way above us. So, you know, I mean, I'd like to say, I wish I could say I was this perfect mom or that Richard was Nobody a perfect is. Yeah. dad. Nobody is. But the tips that I would, the tips that I would impart are kind of like your typical parenting advice, you know, stay consistent, you know, provide great structure, you know, celebrate your kids. Um, don't try and keep them from falling down. Just pick them up when they fall. Um, you know, don't, don't overdo too much for them because, you know, like, let's say, I, I mean, I know this woman and she, she literally writes her son's papers for him. And I'm like, oh, oh I just, I never. So enabling. That. It's so terrible. <laughs> it's yeah. Just like, don't, don't. And they, yeah. Enable is the best word, you know, enable. Sometimes it's hard to see as a mom or as a dad that letting your kids fail is sometimes the best thing you can do. It's mm -hmm. like that whole um, thing about failing better. You know, when we, when we do fail something that we, we haven't taken care of, it teaches us because it feels really bad. And if you keep your kids from their own failures, you know, in life, 
then you're really not teaching them how to be great people. You're just teaching them that you're going to take care of everything and that they are entitled and, you know, that, that they don't, they don't need to, you know, go through those things. But the truth is, it's sometimes the things that make us feel kind of bad. Sometimes are the things we learn the most from. So, yeah. Um, you know, and then again, I think, you know, the consistency piece is so important. It's like, I, I had, I, I was really good at not saying something that I wasn't going to follow through on because I really believe that whether it's in business or it's with your kids, any place, we, we all have what Richard and I called our own personal trust fund. And that means it's not about money. It's about trust, actual trust. It, and that is built yes. over a series of um, incidences that you follow through with over time. And, and the more that you follow through with what you say, the more people trust you, the more they can believe in you, they can count on you. And I know that my kids always knew that if I said something, you know, like, for example, when Jazz was um, a teenager, and she was just starting to stay out late, I mean, I said to her, look, I, you, you're, you know, you're too young. You're 15 years old to be out past 11 o'clock at night. And she had older friends that were driving and that made me totally nervous. So I said, you need to have your friends drop you off at 11 o'clock at night. And which was very hard for me to stay up till because I go to bed very early. And so one night um, in the summer, she came in at, you know, 1120 and I was sitting on the steps and I said, um, Hey, what time is it? And she said, uh, it's 1120. And I go, what time are you supposed to be home? And she's like 11 o'clock. I go, well, thank you very much. You just allowed me to go to bed a half hour early or this summer, because now your new curfew is 1030. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, so, and I, I think this is such an important point. You know, uh, my audience probably heard this and how you're really speaking my language and so much of this, but the follow through I've noticed with friends of mine whose parents didn't follow through, whether it was like, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland next week or we're going to do that. And then they didn't. That so creates trust issues. Then those people grow up and they're sort of expecting people to fail them. And yeah. I will say that my parents did what they said they were going to do. And it's such an important thing. Um, and so this is why when I hear pa parents sort of with a, a young kid, you can't sort of, I don't know, maybe you have a better, <laughs> you'll have a better psychological way of probably expressing it, but this idea of like half-assed abstract thoughts, like, you know, maybe one day we'll go there. You don't do that to a kid. They don't really have the ability to understand that they're going to be asking you next week. When are we going there? Don't make plans like in the sky, you know, unless you can you know, do, yeah. you know, follow through with them. And then the other thing that we were talking about enabling, you know, this goes to adults in my confidence book, you know, I, I, because I'm a writer, I have a, a friend who, you know, sometimes my friends will call me and they'll go, Hey, will you help me with a cover letter for a job or, you know, some sort of enlisting me to write something. And I tell the story about how a time my friend had an issue with a car insurance company. And she said, Hey, can you write the letter for me? But in that moment, I thought, you know what? I'm kind of enabling, so I'm not going to do it for her. And I said, Hey, how about you write a first draft and then let me take a look at it. And she did. And Christine, it was freaking perfect. And in that moment, I gave her the opportunity to be confident about something she wasn't sure she was. I was raving. I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. I would just change that one word. You did it. And and wow, the confidence I was a, a, allowing for her to instill in herself almost by not enabling her, giving her that first shot at it versus me just going, yeah, yeah, I got it. What do you need? Do you know? It's really, it's really a wonderful thing for people. It will help instill confidence if you don't enable them on simple things. That is so true. That is, that is so true. And we can all think of our own lives, um, you know, as, as we built confidence over time with things, how, how that happened. I mean, that's a really great point. Let's uh, get into heartbroken open. Oh, sad. I'm sad because this is, this is big stuff. Your, yeah. I mean, your husband um, sort of suddenly died and uh, I'll just let you tell us about this. Um, tough stuff. Yeah, no, he, he actually didn't sort of suddenly die. He really did. die. <laughs> Just suddenly, yeah, he suddenly died. Sorry. <laughs> Back. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been 16 years. That's why I can say that and laugh. Um, right. I, 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 I couldn't do that for probably 10 years. Actually, I, I could never really laugh about it, but 
he he actually would find the whole the whole scenario of his death quite um almost quite funny in a way too just that he wrote don't sweat the small stuff and he got on a plane um 16 years ago um and on the descent of that flight he had a pulmonary embolism and you know it was just I mean, it was just so crazy. It was just for being 45 years old. You just don't think that's going to happen. And, you know, I know he wasn't feeling well, um, before he left for that trip. Uh, I knew he wasn't feeling well. And I said, you know, you should go to the doctor. He's like, Oh no, no, I'm going to push through. Um, and sure enough, you know, but what we didn't, I'm sure he didn't think he was going to die either. You know what I mean? He just felt like he had kind of a flu or something. And so he was going to New York to promote his latest book. And yeah, it just, it really, it, it, it just, it, it's like the hero's journey, you know, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. It's like, mm-hmm. you're going along and you have this perfect life that you think is a perfect life. And then an event happens and it completely shatters life as you knew it. And, and then you have to pick up the pieces of that life. And for me, it was just, it, and my girls, it was a journey of healing. It was a journey of grieving. Like many people are in grief today for loss. Um, more people probably than historically as a collective we've, we've ever really yes. even seen. So it's, it's a time of a, a journey, a process of healing, a process of rediscovery um, in a way, it's a process of recovering pieces of yourself that are lost in that shattered mess that becomes your life after you go through um, loss. And, and then I don't really, I mean, I'm not really sure which way is worse to know that, would it have been worse to know that Richard was sick and watch him deteriorate? I think so. Um, but then the shock of what we went through was a little yeah. bit like having the carpet pulled out from underneath your feet and then just being dropped without a, without a floor, you know, it's like, there's no floor for a really long time. And, um, you know, certainly, certainly it didn't help at the time that he was really the best husband I could have ever hoped for. And the best father, you know, (laughs) people would, people would say, Oh, you're so lucky that you had such a great love. And I'd be like, uh, excuse me. I do not feel lucky at this point. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think that that's what probably some audience members are thinking. And what I even had a a moment of thinking too, while you were talking like, oh, well, so many people, when this happens to them, they might have so many regrets in their relationship. Um, Even though at that moment you're like, damn it, I don't want this, of course, but I can see where the outside world would go. Well, at least you had all this wonderful time and maybe not a lot of regrets like some other couples do if that were to happen. Not that that's any, you know, consolation, but it, I think it's a thought that came up for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think regret, um, takes different form for different people. You know, for me, I went through a sense of regret at not knowing that Richard was sick, you know? So. And what about like, is there, was there some guilt around that? Was I can only imagine someone being like, ah, he should have gone. Damn it. Now I'm angry at him one day. And now I'm upset at myself the next day for not forcing him. I can just sort of see that playing out in one's head. Oh yeah. I, I have to say that um, that was a tape that I played over and over again that really led me down a very miserable path. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. Um, I, I eventually I started putting to practice our own philosophy and just said, hey, you know, like your thoughts matter to your experience of grief. And and I I stopped those thinking thinking patterns that were very negative because of course there is. You know, I, I really, uh, I love Elizabeth um, Kubler-Ross's work, you know, in the sense that she, she did talk about the stages of grief, but I, I don't believe that they, she ever meant for them to be like, oh, you go through one stage and then you go to the next stage. I think she just defined these different stages of grief that we vacillate all over the mm-hmm. place with. And, you know, bargaining is a very early, you know, definitely an early stage of grief. And also, you know, you get over that because of course you're still, you're still adjusting to the idea that this has happened to your life, you know? And so I think for, for a lot of us, you know, those regrets that we have are just simply that, that kind of bargaining, trying to bargain back what we want back. And, 
you know, hey, can, you, that, can you give us an example of that bargaining that was going in your head for people that might understand that stage? Bargaining? Yeah. Well, it was just like, well, it was like saying those, like, well, if I had known, mm-hmm. if I had known that he was sick, then he wouldn't have died, you know, or, you know, that, that, that might've been a form of bargaining that I was mm-hmm. doing. I, I wasn't, you know, under any illusion that he was coming home, you know, like I, I really did understand right away that this had happened. And um, so I, I didn't go through like that sense of like, I don't know, denial. Like I never was in denial from the moment I heard, I, I really realized, wow, this, this happened. Uh, this is, this is crazy. Like this, this happened. And it also, it, it's, it's everyone. It doesn't matter that you had the comforts of the American dream and, you know, these kind of things. No, devastation. Or that we devastation. it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter that Richard was considered the happiness guru of the Western world right. at the time of his death. He still died. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not, not, not at happy all. at all. No. How, I mean, I can only imagine, like you said, 10 years, you couldn't even joke around about it. Uh, no. And I'm sure, my gosh, it's such a long marriage, such a happy life. And then this sudden thing, I mean, I'm sure you were, I can only imagine the multiple crying every day for days on end. I mean, I've been there when someone didn't die, you know, just a breakup. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so I can no, only imagine. Yeah, no, it's brutal. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing that anyone can ever go through. It, there's nothing harder than losing the people that we love and, and, uh, it is a definite process, like I said, of healing. I, I really had to surrender and trust. Um, fortunately, I had a really deep spiritual faith. Um, I, really, I really knew that in my heart of hearts that this was probably a soul contract between Richard and me. I wasn't happy about it. And, and, it, and it hurt worse than anything has ever hurt in my, in my world. I, I, I can't even imagine. Um, I, I hope to never go through the same kind of loss in my lifetime again, although that's probably, that, that's not likely. I mean, you know, I might go through it again. You know, I'm sure my parents, it, my parents mm-hmm. are getting on, you know, my dad is 89 and planning his own memorial service. <laughs> yeah. I will get, by the way, I just, uh, that's such a thing. You know, my mom the other day was calling. She's like, you know, I'm looking around for churches for the right place for me to have a funeral. I'm like, Oh my God, please. Can we not have this conversation? You know, I think it's really cute. Actually. I, I, I have really, I videotaped my dad. Um, and I thought, well, cause he's just really obsessed with it. And I'm like, I, I think it's just really sweet that he's, that he's so at peace with the idea that he's planning his own memorial service. And, yeah. you know, he, he did tell me that he did say that um, he wanted me to sing a duet with my brother, who's actually a professional singer. And I, I laughed. I said, dad, I haven't sang since the last time I sang a duet with Brent and it was in church in Hawaii or something. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, that's what I want. I want you to sing a duet with your brother at my memorial service. So I said, well, dad, I, I think my brother and I should practice before you die so that you have the benefit of being there and we'll do it at your 90th birthday. How's that? Aww. And then we will do it at your memorial service. <laughs> What, what did you, what was the turning point for you when you finally started to feel out of the major haze and feel like there might be a glimmer of hope? Cause it's so hopeless at first, nothing seems fun, nothing, and not even eating, like everything's horrible. So what, what was the turning point or, or you know, what happened there that kind of made you go, okay, hold on. I think I'm going to be able to move forward here. Well, there, there are many, many turning points um, through my process of grief. But there was a real pivot. There was, there's a couple pivots. One was being um, on Oprah and commemorating Richard on Oprah Mm. um, by publishing a book called An Hour to Live, An Hour to Love, the true story of the best gift ever given. And that was a letter that Richard had um, written to me on our 18th wedding anniversary, three years before he died. He was reading Stephen Levine's book, A Year to Live, and he... um, he answered a question that Stephen poses. And the question is, if you had an hour to live and could make one phone call, who would it be to? What would you say? Mm. And why are you waiting? And then he wrote this 37 page love letter to me, um, which was incredible that I published 
as with my response in it as a tribute back to him. Mm. And then Oprah had us on an episode to tribute Richard, which was just really lovely and beautiful. Um, that was a huge pivot turn. And a lot of times they say, you know, there's that you receive your message in the mess. And I remember um, distinctly receiving my message from Oprah because I was talking about grief and you know, even that the idea that I, I just wasn't feeling my life the same before Richard died, that I was feeling it after he died, like so intensely, I'd have to say my experience of being alive grew um, with his death, which is just so profound. That's where mm. Heartbook and Open comes in, like that you, your heart could break, but that you could open to more life because of it, you know, and that you could awaken to what it really means to be alive. And, and that's what happened to me. I, I, um, you know, was just living my life, being a mom, like supporting Richard. I'd written books with him and all that, but hadn't really owned my career and was just humming along. And then bam, you know, I, it was like, suddenly the whole world looked different to me. It, it was brighter even because I was so sensitive in a way that I hadn't been sensitive. I had so much more deep feeling and compassion and empathy um, than I had had before because I hadn't really been through anything horrible or hard that, well, I, I, hard, yes, but not horribly hard. <laughs> No, right. Well, and it's those contrasts, those contrasts, sometimes on the other side of it, it is such a profile. Like I always tell people, cause my first book's on thyroid health. And uh, when you suffer so badly with any kind of physical ailment, and then you're, you get beyond it, like whatever you're oh, yeah. cancer, then life is some like, I, I almost am thankful for it because people who've never been sick or never had that happen almost, I don't know if they have the ability to have the level of gratitude about their health that people who have overcome something have. It's like a gift that keeps on giving. Yes, it, it totally is. And, and that's exactly what I'm speaking to. Um, so that was one pivot turn. The last, the, the really the big pivot that helped me so much, you know, and I have to say, I, I felt so held by grace in the process of healing. And I think it's because I was really good about surrendering and I was living very presently. I lived in the present moment more than I ever have, I practiced living in the present moment quite by accident because quite frankly, the present moment was the easiest place to live in grief because of the regrets and the yes. guilt that I felt. And then because I couldn't dream of a future without Richard, then I found myself landing in the present moment and feeling like, okay, I can do this. One little baby step at a time, I can do this. So the story I want to share is just so meaningful to me and it is such a miraculous story. And it really did represent a true pivot um, toward healing. It happened just two years after Richard died. My girls and I were getting on a plane. We were flying on a commuter flight back from Eugene, Oregon to San Francisco, which was just a 45, 50 minute flight. And we went up to the ticket agents at, at the ticket counter. And the guy that was behind the counter said, um, you guys aren't seated together on the flight. It's Christmas time. And uh, do you want to be seated together? And I said, Oh no, it's a short flight. These, the girls are older. They don't care, you know, and he took it upon himself to rearrange our seats, which is really important. Um, so we go and we sit down and the girls are on the aisle in the window uh, next to me and I'm in the aisle and then it left the window seat open and a man walks up to get in. And when he's standing there, I get this really odd feeling like chills come up and down my spine and the girls start giggling. And I'm, I'm like, what is that? Like, what is this? And he sits down and I want to, I really want to talk to him, but he pulls his laptop out. So I, I don't because he's clearly working. And so on the descent of the flight, I still was like in my head, I'm like, I really need to talk to this guy. And so I start to convert, I start a conversation with him and I say, is this a work day for you? And he said, yeah, it is. I'm really sorry to love to talk with you. I just, you know, I've got a meeting this afternoon and he goes, what about you? I noticed you have your computer. And I said, oh yeah, um, I'm a writer. So technically I suppose every day is a potential work day. And he said, oh, have you been published? And I said, yeah, I have, but you might be most familiar with my late husband's work, um, Richard Carlson, he wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And 
the guy just got really visibly shaken and mm. sort of just looked weird, you know, and I just kept saying, what? Like, did you know? Him? No, I didn't know him. What? And he just says, well, did he die on a flight um, to JFK a little over two years ago? And I said, yeah, how did you know it was JFK? And he says to me, because I was seated directly behind him on oh, that God. flight. I was the first to assist the crew in lifting his body out of his seat. I'm getting chills right now. And I just burst into tears because what he didn't know was that my prayer was to meet someone who Aww. was on that flight and talk to them and and find out what oh, happened. What a gift. That's what yeah. everyone I think listening is like, oh yeah, that's what you would hope, right? If you're in that yeah. situation, can I just talk to someone who's there? Give me the rundown, something. Yeah, it was just an incredible gift. And just, he said, you know, I always wanted to tell you that your husband died very peacefully. He looked very Aww. at peace. And I just, you know, I mean, what are the chances of that? There, there, there are no chances. <laughs> it's a mystical, amazing, that is magical. And I'm so happy for you that you, you got an opportunity to chat with that guy. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And again, that was a huge pivot for me. It happened two years after Richard's death. And, and, and then I think the rest is that I realized that um, I would always miss Richard for the rest of my life, that that was never going to change and that that was never going to go away, but that I had to be in love with my life and that I had so many incredible blessings happening in my life. Um, my daughter, Jazz, you know, has five kids now and wow. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm continually blessed um, in so many ways um, with work. I love with, you know, great friends with support. Um, I, you know, I just, I just focus on that. And I, I, I've lived, um, I just feel like I've lived a very, very, very full life. And part of that is that I learned that embracing grief is a big part of that, that we can't take just the blessings of our life. We have to take all of it and we have to work with all of it. And, you know, yeah, it's hard. I mean, there's some really, really hard things. And yet if we just, you know, if we just take it one baby step at a time and we do our best to keep our attitude, you know, in the present moment, in, a, in as much a positive way as you can. I wasn't positive every day in grief. I mean, I was sad. I was super sad. My eyes looked sad for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, like you said, with, you know, your thyroidism, you know, it was like one day, like I just woke up on Richard's side of the bed and I felt different. Mm. It was like, I had come to full acceptance of my loss and I was grateful again for having loved. And that was really the cue for me. I I've really healed. Yeah. To be, instead of being angry, sad, bitter, all the things about the loss, you had the gratitude. That's such a, yeah. What a turning point. Yeah. Incredible. It, your, your book, Heartbroken Open, um, is really sort of your inspiring true story. You've touched on a bit and now the Lifetime Move Network is doing a movie on it, basically about your life, right? They are. They are. It's called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, the Christine Carlson story. It is now out on Lifetime. Um, and, you know, you can, you can just uh, search it and then find it. And yeah. And Heather Locklear was just so sweet. I got, I really got, got to meet her and got to know her. We spent quite a bit of time together in um, production for the movie and really spawned an incredible friendship. Um, she played me and the girls um, were portrayed by Natasha Bure and Ella Dorsch. Um, and then Richard was um, portrayed by, oh my God, I'm totally blanking out on his name. <laughs> oh my gosh. We'll have such to. A great, such a great guy. <laughs> we'll have to look it up. Hold on. Yeah, right. We'll keep going. I'll find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't believe I'm not thinking of his name. That is terrible. Um, I see his face. He was he's just so sweet. But yeah, they they did a great job with the movie and it was um, 
It was wonderful. I mean, it was hard, you know, it was kind of weird to watch. I have to say the first two times, third time, I really liked the movie. The first two times I was like, okay, this is just too weird. <laughs> is it, is it Rob Moran? No. James Healy. Okay. I'm looking at, I'm trying to look at the, the top build cast and yeah, uh, I have to no. see who looks to play Richard. Oh, Jason McDonald. There you go. There Sorry, you go. Jason. All right. We needed to give him, <laughs> we needed to give him a name here. I had to look that up. All yeah. Right. Yeah. Jason <laughs> McDonald was wonderful. He did a great job capturing Richard. He's a great guy. And you know, um, yeah, it was, he did a great job. I was really pleased with his performance as I was also very pleased with Heather too. I mean, she's just a really wonderful actress. I'm so looking forward to seeing it. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, how did you view future love after this? Have you been in relationships? Is it even an interest? What, what moves forward? You know, you were 45 and this happened. That's pretty young. I was 43. Richard was 45. So wow. I was very young and kind of like in the prime of my life. So yes, my love life has not been boring. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. I like that. <laughs> no, my love life has not been boring. I, I haven't partnered, um, but I've had some amazing men come into my life. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of, I mean, I had some experience dating as a teenager, but then I met Richard when I was 18. So let's just say I've made up for lost time. <laughs> All right. And last 16 years, it's been, you know, it's it's been fun and fine and um, there's been one man that I've been always circling around that I really just adore. And he's nothing like my husband, but he's a wonderful man. And we'll see, maybe it's the, maybe he's going to be the one I settle down with. I don't know. But, but in general, I'm assuming based on your last comment there that you are open to something like that again. And long I am. Term. Yeah, I am. It'd have to be the right situation and the right sure. person. And I probably wouldn't marry, you know, it, it'd be like, um, but, you know, I think I'm ready to, you know, have the kind of companionship that's ongoing. And it just seems like men that I date, I date for about two years and then I'm, it just doesn't go. And then you're done with them. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, okay. You know, it just, yeah, that's usually what happens. And, and I don't ever have big, bad breakups. It's just a real fizzle out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually end up friends with most of the men I date and, and, um, and it's all good. You know, it just isn't quite the right fit. It, I think that, that it takes a special man to come into my world and to know that um, I really clearly have had a great, great love and perhaps the great love of my life um, is what I've always thought and said. That doesn't mean that we don't have enough room for other great loves. I mean, I definitely have felt that my heart is big enough to have many great loves in it. So, um, but to have great partnership again is different as a different requirement. It, it really is. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, I'm very open to it, but not in a, not, I really am totally fine without it. Like I'm, I really felt from the very beginning that I could live solo for quite a while and um, and I've done that and it's, it's been a really wonderful experience. I think I give a lot of women permission to be okay with that too, that you don't have to be desperate to have a man. I mean, you know, it, it's okay to just sit on your own branch for a while, you know, <laughs> swing on your own swing. That's what I say. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I, I love that you came out and shared this because it's another healing book and, uh, even possibly, probably the film as well, I'm assuming for oh, yeah. people that are going through this type of grief and also to hear you coming out the other side, being very honest about the years of, you know, torturous crying and whatever, until you had these enlightenments. I also do want to let people know you've got popular video based. Don't sweat the small stuff, happiness training courses. That's on don't sweat.com. We'll put everything in the show notes, but you guys teach people how to find inspiration and direction right in the middle of life's uncertainties. And uh, these courses feature video footage of your late husband as well, correct? They do. It's very special. It's, um, yeah, it's very, very special. I, I love that that's available for everybody. And, um, you know, sometimes people just learn better through video trainings or, you know, uh, audio books or, you know, that kind of medium versus uh, reading a book. So I think that's wonderful. And I just wanted to give everyone that resource. Before we wrap it up, what are some other thoughts or things you'd like to share with us about 
this book and then the, the film that sort of came after it? Well, um, you know, there's just, there's so many layers to this, you know, first of all, I mean, I, I love to, you know, the writing piece of it. I mean, that, that is probably one of the greatest accomplishments as a writer is to have your book picked up as a movie, which is just yes. really huge for me, you know, as a writer, it's, it's a huge accomplishment. So that was, that was one thing. I'm very proud of it. Um, the second thing is that, you know, I, from the very beginning have realized that I had a lot of tools in my tool belt, um, to go through grief. And I, I often wondered when I was laying on the floor, just completely heartbroken, how the average person did this because it was horrendous for me. And I really was layered with support and tools and, and people that, that really understood how to go through loss in my life. That that's what propelled me forward and wanting to lead women's retreats and lead women and create programs and courses for people going through loss um, and write books. You know, Heartbroken Open was my first book. I re-released it for the movie. And then I had written From Heartbreak to Wholeness, The Hero's Journey to Joy, which is really my how to go through grief. And then I've launched many, many women's retreats that I invite women to um, come on as a, as a sign of celebration after going through um, huge change and transition, you know, we, we don't ever realize that it is really a rediscovery um, thing that we go through, that we have to rediscover who we are outside of this loss that's created this annihilation of our identity, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, we go into identity crisis for many different reasons in life, not only loss, but you know, if you've had a career for 40 years and suddenly you, you, you're retiring, you go through it. If you mm-hmm. are a mom and you're really, um, you know, attached to being a mom and you go through empty nest, you go through it. If you go to the doctor and suddenly you find out you've got health issues, you never thought you had, you go through it. So there's all sorts of reasons why we, um, have our identity go through crisis, but When we do, it is a process of rediscovery. It is a process of recovering yourself and also embracing what is true for you, what is authentically true for you at this time in your life. And I think answering questions, um, you know, going through a deep inquiry process and answering questions about what you value is really important in order to rediscover who you are and And um, the last thing I'd love to say is just that the circumstances of life don't make or break you, but they do reveal you. So how you show up in them is that's who you are, but you can change and you can choose the path of um, being the hero. You can choose not to be a victim of your circumstances and find your way back to um, wholeness and to love again, and to a much brighter future. So mm. that's what I have to say. <laughs> I, what a, I love I love all of it. I'm so grateful to have you on. Everyone will put everything to connect with Christine in the show notes, but it's christinecarlson.com, and that's with a K. And then don'tsweat.com for the video trainings if you want to jump right in there. And of course, this Lifetime movie. So I'm going to go find that immediately and watch it uh, in the next few days. And I'm so excited to have spoken with you first, actually, <laughs> before I, before I see it and c- congratulations on your book, what you said earlier about a book becoming a movie is literally one of the biggest feats. I know 21 times New York times, bestselling authors who've tried to get there, but you know, I mean, it just takes forever. Nothing happens. Oh, what wonderful that it just got picked up. And also what an inspiring um, topic too, as well. And if you're going to do a movie. So I love that so much. And just uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you so much. All right. And for everyone else, we'll see you next time. Hey, listeners, you know, over the years, a ton of companies have approached me to collaborate, but I will only promote companies whose products I believe in and that I actually use and consume on a regular basis. So let me tell you about some of my favorite companies that I can offer you discounts for. Rep Provisions, an amazing company doing incredible things for our planet, topsoil, and animals with regenerative agriculture. And it's my number one source for quality pasture-raised meat and chicken. Visit repprovisions.com and use code L15 for 15% off. 
I'm also obsessed with a company called Carnivore Crisps. They make a lean, all-natural, and delicious alternative to conventional snacking, made with just real meat and real salt. Totally addictive, and my favorite ones are the beef brisket and the ribeye. Visit carnivorecrisps.com and use code PALEO10 for 10% off. I also love and regularly use Paleo Valley products. They make amazing supplements and delicious paleo products. I use the Superfood Greens Powder, Grass-Fed Beef Sticks, the Organ Complex, and their Bone Broth Bars. I love the lemon and apple. I also use their Essential Sea Complex and more. Visit paleovalley.com forward slash promos forward slash LRUS for 15% off. I also love Primal Kitchen. They make delicious paleo-approved, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and no refined sugar products. And I use them daily, from their collagen powders and sauces and marinades to their avocado and olive oil. So good, so healthy. Visit PrimalKitchen.com and use code L10 for 10% off. I also love paleo powder and use it almost on everything I cook. They make incredible seasoning blends and they also have these incredible grain-free coatings that feel just like crispy breadings that you would have had prior to knowing that there's another way. So visit paleopowder.com and use code L15 for 15% off. 